Greetings to you in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. I'm Reverend Katie Yates Brungraber, coming to you today as the guest preacher from St. James Presbyterian Church in Mechanicsburg. Due to the COVID-19 coronavirus, at the recommendation of medical professionals and the Presbytery, the body of Christ is not gathering physically this morning, but we are gathering virtually and in spirit, in praise and gratitude. Let us pray. Gracious Lord, we thank you for this beautiful day. We recognize that many people are feeling unsettled. There are so many questions. And so, Lord, we ask that you silence all voices but your own. We welcome your Holy Spirit and thank you for illuminating these scriptures that we might hear your word for us today. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Our lectionary text this morning is from the book of Exodus. We're reading from chapter 17, starting with verse 1. Listen for and hear the word of God. From the wilderness of Sin, the whole congregation of the Israelites journeyed by stages, as the Lord commanded. They camped at Rephidim, but there was no water for the people to drink. The people quarreled with Moses and said, Give us water to drink. Moses said to them, Why do you quarrel with me? Why do you test the Lord? But the people thirsted there for water, and the people complained against Moses and said, Why did you bring us out of Egypt to kill us and our children and livestock with thirst? So Moses cried out to the Lord, What shall I do with this people? They are almost ready to stone me. The Lord said to Moses, Go on ahead of the people and take some of the elders of Israel with you. Take in your hand the staff with which you struck the Nile and go. I will be standing there in front of you on the rock at Oreb. Strike the rock and water will come out of it so that the people may drink. Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel He called the place Massa and Meribah because the Israelites quarreled and tested the Lord, saying, Is the Lord among us or not? This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. People complaining to God is something that happens a lot in Scripture. In fact, the word complain occurs over 60 times in the biblical canon. If we were to read the Bible through in a year, chances are we'd encounter some biblical character complaining every week. Now, the Israelites take the prize, take the prize as masters of murmur and complaint. It's recorded at least nine times. Job, who finds himself attacked by the adversary, complains seven times. The psalmists, they certainly complain about their circumstances. And don't get me started on the people who complain constantly to the prophets about what God is and what God is not doing. Oh, and in the New Testament, everyone complains about Jesus. The people complain about Jesus. From John 7, there was considerable complaining about him among the crowds. While some were saying he's a good man, others were saying, no, he is deceiving the crowd. From Luke 19, 
When Jesus came to the place, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for I must stay at your house today. So Zacchaeus hurried down and was happy to welcome Jesus. All who saw it began to grumble and said, he has gone to be the guest of one who is a sinner. The Pharisees complain about Jesus. In Luke 5, the Pharisees and their scribes were complaining to Jesus' disciples, saying, why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? The Jews complain about Jesus. John 6, then the Jews began to complain about him because he said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. Even Jesus' disciples complain about Jesus when he told them, as recorded in John 6, those who eat my flesh and drink my blood abide in me and I in them. Oh yes, whether sitting in heaven or traveling with the Israelites through the desert or walking the earth as fully human, fully divine son of God, the triune God has gotten an earful over the years. In today's lectionary story, Moses calls the place of complaint Massa and Meribah, that is, test and quarrel. In Hebrew, rib, the rib of Meribah, means to strive, to contend, to find fault with. So Meribah means the place of dissatisfaction. Commentator John Durham who was the professor of Hebrew and Old Testament at Southeastern Baptist Seminary in Wake Forest, has an interesting take on this Exodus story, and I'll quote him. The whole point of and reason for this narrative is Yahweh's miraculous provision for his people by supplying water where there was none from the unlikeliest of all spots, a rock. The point of this narrative is underscored by its summary conclusion. Moses names the place testing and dissatisfaction, a name that reverses the sequence of events since the dissatisfied people put Yahweh and Moses to the test by their complaining, a complaining which posed the unbelievable question, is Yahweh present with us or not? After all that Yahweh had done for them, this question is scandalous. Yahweh had freed them from bondage in Egypt, rescued them from Egyptian soldiers at the Red Sea and provided for them in the wilderness with manna and with quail, and still they did not trust God. What the people had to learn was that God was with them, no matter what. What the people had to learn was that the leaders had to be called out ahead of the people, and that Moses had to be called out ahead of the leaders in order to follow God's instruction. God kept God's promise. I will be standing there. Again, Professor Durham offers a helpful insight. Once more then, Yahweh provides for the need of his people, this time for the physical need of water. Once more, when a need arises, the Israelites do not wait for it to be met. Indeed, they do not even assume that it can be met. Rather, they attack Yahweh and put him on trial by attacking Moses to put him on trial. Their thirst, of course, was real, but infinitely more real was the powerful presence of Yahweh in their midst. The lesser reality, the reality of their thirst, they embraced. The more important reality they ignored and doubted. So once more, Yahweh dealt with the lesser reality, the thirst, by demonstration of the greater underlying reality the presence of God. 
Yahweh hears the cries of his people and provides for them. Yahweh uses the resource Moses has in his hand, literally the staff, to apply to the circumstance. The staff Moses had with him when he went before Pharaoh in Egypt. The staff Moses had with him when the Lord parted the Red Sea. God used that staff to apply to the circumstance. At the Lord's direction, Moses strikes the rock and water flows. Let's put this in context. The author of Deuteronomy tells us that it was an 11-day journey across the Sinai Peninsula. The grumblers, the people who grew up in Egypt, delayed the journey with their grumbling. Not only did they delay the journey, they did not get to cross over into the Promised Land. It would be a new generation that would cross over. The new generation had grown up in the wilderness and had learned to pay attention to what God was doing. God led them by a pillar of cloud by day and fire by night. When the pillar moved, the people moved. When the pillar stopped, the people stopped. Along the way, Moses prayed for God to have mercy on the people. And along the way, God led Moses out in front of the elders who then got to relay the good news to the people of what God was doing. God's instruction to Moses from today's text reads like this. Go on ahead of the people and take some of the elders of Israel with you. Take in your hand the staff with which you struck the Nile, and go. I will be standing there in front of you on the rock at Horeb. Strike the rock, and water will come out of it, so that the people may drink. Even in these uncertain times, the Lord is standing out ahead of the people. Even with the President of the United States calling for a national emergency, even with schools and universities closing, uh, sports and Broadway productions shutting down, and corporate worship rightly being canceled, all to try to slow the spread of infection, the Lord is standing there on the rock as he was for Moses and the elders of Israel. And the Lord will use the resources we have in our hands to give us what we need, helping us navigate this difficult time and this unfamiliar path. In these unsettling times, There are things we can do in the spiritual realm to be Christ's church while we take physical precautions. We can pray for the leaders of our congregations, the leaders of our government and the world. We can refuse to get caught up in the anxiety of the world. We can remember God's faithfulness and provision for our families, our congregations, and for the greater church. We can educate ourselves with reliable scientific information and make the best decisions we can with the information we have. When the information changes, we can change our response strategies. We can give ourselves time away from the onslaught of media coverage. We can turn the TV channel from the news to, I don't know, your favorite, I like Andy Griffith. 
We can change the radio from the news on occasion to some really good music, something that stirs our hearts and fills our souls. We can pick up the phone and talk to family and neighbors and friends. We can send cards of encouragement to those who are in fragile situations. And we can make sure that our shut-ins have what they need, being sure to only deliver to the porch, not to visit in person right now. In closing, let's consider how the Lord is standing out in front of us with the words of the summons. Will you come and follow me? The lyricists John Bell and Graham Mall may be familiar to you. John Bell is a member of the Iona community. He's a Church of Scotland minister and a Scottish hymn writer. Will you come and follow me if I but call your name? Will you go where you don't know and never be the same? Will you let my love be shown? Will you let my name be known? Will you let my life be grown in you and you in me? Will you leave yourself behind if I but call your name? Will you care for cruel and kind and never be the same? Will you risk the hostile stare should your life attract or scare? Will you let me answer prayer in you and you in me will you let the blinded see if i but call your name will you set the prisoners free and never be the same will you kiss the leper clean and do such as this unseen and admit It always makes me cry. Admit to what I mean in you and you in me. Will you love the you you hide if I but call your name? Will you quell the fear inside and never be the same? Will you use the faith you found to reshape the world around through my sight and touch and sound in you and you in me? Lord, your summons echoes true when you but call my name. Let me turn and follow you and never be the same. In your company I'll go where your love and footsteps show. Thus I'll move and live and grow in you and you in me. Friends, keep looking forward. God is with us no matter what. Let us not complain. Let us tell stories of God's faithfulness. Rather than make the mistakes of the Israelites, let us assume that God can meet our needs. Let us not attack our leaders the way the Israelites attacked Moses. The Lord will be standing there out ahead of us. And by God's grace, with trust and hope in the Lord, our teaching elders and our ruling elders, with no special powers and no crystal balls, will hear the Lord's instruction and lead us all in faith 
and obedience. Thanks be to God. To God be the glory. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your presence. We thank you for your leadership and for those you have called into leadership in your church for such a time as this. To you be all glory, honor, and praise. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of God's Holy Spirit be with us all evermore.